Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Boca Valley Research Center virtual seminar series. We are really pleased to host Jolene Swain today, talking about the very hungry caterpillar temperature and humidity impacts on an insect pest of fruit trees. I absolutely love the title. It, uh, it's so catchy, but it also really highlights the, uh, the concern of pests and, and keeping them in balance. Uh, my name is Dawn Hansen. I'm the Executive Director of the Bulkley Valley Research Centre. I'm pleased to be hosting this seminar series from the Gidim Den Clan Traditional Territory of the Wet'suwet'en Nation. I'd like to thank the Bulkley Valley Community Foundation and the Bulkley Valley Credit Union for their, some of their financial support of our seminar series, which allows us to keep bringing these to the public, public and hosting scientists sharing their research. Jolene Swain lives on a wilderness farmstead in the Kispiox Valley on the unceded lands of the Gitsan First Nation. She's spent the last five seasons growing organic vegetables, producing seed crops for the BC Eco Seed Co-op, and helping get the hay in for the milk cow and the sheep flock. Before settling into farm life, Jolene worked and studied across Western Canada surveying pikas and plants in the alpine tundra completing biodiversity surveys in the boreal forest and completing her master's research on caterpillars and climate change in organic fruit orchards. Jolene has also worked as a consultant in the organic industry for the past six years and is currently the central and northern BC land matcher with young agrarians. Uh, welcome to you Jolene and thanks very much for taking the time today. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, it's great to be here. I've been in the Smithers area, or I live up in the Kispiak, so I've been in the region for the last almost six years now. And although we're not in apple orchard country, the terrace area did used to be known as the Okanagan of the North. Uh, and there are still a lot of remnant fruit trees around and Smithers as well. And, and a lot of those fruit trees certainly do have pests. So hopefully this is still relevant to the region. Um, so you probably all had a chance to read my title by now. Uh, just to warn you, the caterpillar I work with is not as charming as this one or one of the charismatic kind of butterflies or moths you might often see. It's just a lowly little Tortrix moth caterpillar. Uh, so of course, um, we know that surface temperatures have been increasing over the past century and they're projected to continue to rise. Um, in temperate regions, most of this warming is happening in the winter and in the spring. Um, right now, we're definitely experiencing some interesting spring weather here, lows of minus six tonight. Um, and organisms and populations don't necessarily respond to increased mean temperatures. They do, however, respond to uh, extremes, extreme, and especially extreme weather events. So it's not just an increase in mean temperature that we're experiencing, but greater variability around the mean. And this can result in larger amplitudes um, of seasonal and daily temperatures, which can lead to an increase in extreme weather events, such as heat waves, cold waves, droughts, uh, freezing events, a lot of unexpected weather. And even though, you know, maybe our summers get longer and our frost-free days expand, that doesn't mean we're out of the woods. If we get an earlier start to spring, that actually can increase the risk of a frost event that could cause damage to, to crops and also to their pests. But a lot of the research, of course, is focused on the crop because who cares if, about the pests if you lose the crop? But I care. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's really important to understand your pest species when working in a, in a system. Um, there's a lot of uh, traditional kind of calendar spraying for controlling pests and it doesn't, it, there's no like one size fits all. So the more you know about an insect, the more you can manage it. And um, yeah, ectotherms in particular are going to respond very readily to their environment. Some of the ways insects, organisms might respond are through changes in development, uh, population growth and generations, uh, their ability to overwinter if the, if the winters are milder. Um, extreme events can also lead to collapse of some species, uh, range expansion or contraction if species are already at the edge of their range. Uh, outbreaks are obviously the big problem, not just in crop systems, but forest systems. And trying to predict those continues to be an ongoing, uh, yeah, interesting field of research. And then of course there's kind of changes in phenology and life history events. So 
mis mismatching of synchrony and synchrony between like bud burst and emergence of, of pests or migration patterns. Uh, and just to note, there are some bees here and they aren't actually true. They aren't solely ectotherms. They're actually known as heterotherms because they can generate some, some heat in the hive. Um, and this picture down here is just an example during a drought year you know, an outbreak of locusts or uh, grasshoppers just devastated this entire field of carrots. Uh, and this is some kind of damage by aphids in the apple orchards. One of the seasons I was there where when it's very hot and dry, the plants get stressed out. And there were so many aphids on these branches that they were just dripping with honeydew and the apples were covered in, in sticky, honeydew and all the picker's hands were completely covered. Lena, I see on the line, might remember that. <laughs> uh, and then just kind of a note, uh, we know that or the species goes complete, undergoes complete metamorphosis, which means they go through four distinct life stages. Um, this, my species is called the ice spotted bud moth. I'll tell you a little bit more about it. But the important thing to think about with climate change and weather patterns is that there's not just differences between species, but there's differences within species. So depending on which life stage a species is at might impact how it's going to respond to changing weather patterns. Um, and further to complicate things, it's not just between life stages where there might be differences, but even within life stages. So for instance, um, the egg stage, during the early part of development, their metabolic rate uh, demands are quite low, but as they get closer to hatch or eclosion, they're going to have higher metabolic demands. And during respiration, there's a loss of water. So conserving water is a really important thing when you're an egg and you're not mobile, you can't go anywhere, you're pretty exposed to the environments. Whereas being um, a caterpillar or a moth, you have the ability to move and kind of control escape from unfavorable conditions, but eggs and pupa are gonna be a little more stuck where they're at. So you gotta kind of think about your strategy. The bud moth also doesn't lay its eggs in clusters. Some, a lot of species do. The ones we see uh, in the, I've noticed in the apple trees by the info center in Smithers, we get big infestations of ermine moth. They, and similar to, um, Tent, forest tent caterpillars. They lay their eggs in big masses and form big clusters of caterpillars. The bud moth has a different strategy, which is to kind of lay its eggs one at a time all over the place. And that has definitely has some benefits to predation. Uh, you can't, a predator is not gonna come up on your eggs and just eat them all at once. So here's the life cycle of the eye spotted bud moth. Now, this isn't the worst pest of apples. Um, the worst pest that you might be familiar with is called the codling moth. That's been a problem in orchards for, for as long as people have been orcharding. And the unique thing about the so South Okanagan and most apple growing regions, they found a way to control the codling moth. And that's your kind of classic worm in the apple moth. Whereas bud moth is a little bit more of a like, pick away at the surface. It doesn't crawl right in and destroy the apple. But the thing is, once you control a species like codling moth, you've opened up um, you've opened up the buffet for other species. So it's a constantly moving tar target when you're trying to manage pests. And this pest is kind of the new hot pest in the region. So one of the main ways they control it is through BT sprays, which are pretty finicky. And those work mainly when the species is, is in a lower, smaller instar. And usually when they're targeting other leaf rollers, they're spraying at this time of year. And these larvae are, they might knock them back a little bit with BT, but that's not going to kill these larvae. It's really effective with smaller instars. So the timing of the management has been, is kind of, is part of the, was part of the issue. This is just a picture of the leaf nest, the, they call them spin-ups. They take the leaves, they stick them to each other. Uh, the, most of the damage is happening at this latter part of the season because that's when the apples are, are ripening. And when they stick a spun up to an apple, they just start chewing, causing some surface damage and cos cosmetic, but also it's gonna affect the, not just the cosmetics, but the ability to store the apple. They overwinter as a larva, which is also pretty unique. Um, 
not, I mean, it's not uncommon, but often the hardier life stages are the eggs and the pupa. The larva are basically little sacks of water. So it's, you've got to work really hard to get yourself to a state where you're not going to freeze. Uh, they can actually tolerate down to minus 28. So prior to overwintering, they're going to do everything they can to remove water from their bodies, take out any particles or nucleating agents that ice can form around, uh, assuming they, they can't tolerate freezing which we'll talk, talk more about. Um, yeah, and then they start their generation as the egg and that's right in the middle of summer. So it's kind of not great timing because the egg is actually one of the most sensitive, drought sensitive life stages. Uh, it can't move. It's got a high surface area to volume ratio. So it's, it's been losing a lot of water and it can't go and take up water either. So it's possible that this timing is not ideal. And this species is known to be more coastal so I would expect to see it in kind of the ter terrace area, definitely in the Fraser Valley. It's not usually as big of a problem in the Okanagan. So the question is kind of why, why now? Why did it show up? So this is kind of the, yeah, the Okanagan, which you might be familiar with. I actually did my research down here in the, the Similkameen and the bud moth has always been a problem in this area, but mostly up here in the central northern area where it's a bit cooler, a bit more humid, and the Okanagan Valley also has the lake effects of more moderating temperatures. Down here in the Karameos, it's more, it's drier, it's a narrow valley, there's just a small river running through it, and these this can lead to more extremes. So this is, the bud moth wasn't ever a problem down here until a few years before I started my study, and which was why I kind of was brought in to do this research. So I wanted to know why it had become a problem down here where it had always been around, but why was it suddenly uh, having an outbreak? And first thing we had to do was find a little bit more about it. And just to show you what the kind of systems look like down there, if you're not familiar with uh, orcharding, this is kind of your typical uh, orchard system. There aren't many of the kind of old old plantings anymore. They are, they're high density. The apple trees are planted very close together. They're pruned very hard. They're on dwarfing rootstock, so they have very small, small root balls. Uh, they're often irrigated through drip or micro jet sprinklers. Um, this makes it very easy for management and for picking, but the important thing about these practices is that they're under our control. We can't control the weather, but we can control how we manage the orchard. So while a lot of studies address the effects of frost on, on fruit buds, leaf buds, every year they're measuring uh, whether what temperature the cherry blossoms might die at because they want to know if they've just lost their crop or not and should just uh, move on. Um, but there's not a lot of research, as much research on what happens to the, the pests at this stage. And I thought that was really interesting because once they emerge from overwintering, they're starting to feed, they're going to be introducing water into their bodies and nucleating agents and their vulnerability to freezing is going to increase significantly, uh, you would think. Um, so even though they can handle down to minus 28 when they're overwintering, once they come out, they're going to be more susceptible. Um, the other time of year, of course, is that that summer hot and dry year when the eggs are are development are being laid. Uh, so it's a fairly long window, and it overlaps with kind of the July heat. And if anyone's spent time in the South Okanagan or in the Smokemean, you'll know that it gets pretty pretty hot and pretty dry. And that's also what makes it a great region for growing organic apples. It's the organic capital of Canada. It has the highest density of organic farms there. Mainly, not so much size-wise, but number of farms. They're a bit smaller. Uh, the climate's great for apples. You do not want to grow apples in the Fraser Valley. There's more fungal diseases, and those are really hard to manage organically. So that's a really big advantage to the Okanagan and Samokamine growing areas. But it's also a pretty harsh environment for um, you know, it's not a natural environment for apples either, or a lot of crops. It's a, it's a desert, it's a semi-arid desert. And just for some reference, uh, there's a lot of research into kind of bud freeze thresh thresholds. They have different names for all the stages of bud development. So here at Green Tip, for instance, you might see 90% uh, mortality at minus 16. 
um, or silver tip and a green tip minus 10 will cause 90% mortality. And then once you get to the pink stage, you're really worried about frost. Uh, the growers have lots of fans in their orchard. They used to use old kerosene heaters. They they'd put around the orchard uh, on nights where frost might be coming. They all have alarms set if the temperature drops to, to minus two. Everybody's running out, turning on fans and heaters. Um, yeah. So my questions were, are, were, uh, can, uh, what, so the first part is, the cold tolerance of the spring feeding larval instars. How are they going to respond to weather extremes? The second part is looking at the effect of temperature and humidity on egg eclosion and rate of development. And the third part of my research is to, to look at the field side of things and try to see how the canopy and irrigation and flight timing of flight might impact uh, survival. Uh -huh. And this, this chapter I did publish. So if you want to read more, it's in the Canadian Entomologist, not a go gotten around to the second chapter. Um, so to determine their cold to tolerance, first thing I wanted to know was what temperatures they could tolerate. So the first thing I did was I froze the caterpillars um, right down to minus 30. And Tried to and measured when their tissues froze, and that's known as the super cool, super cooling point. And this is when this at this point an exotherm is released because when the, the water goes from liquid to solid, then there's actually a, a yeah, then an exotherm, the latent energy. Some species can actually handle freezing and they can go well below their super cooling point. Other species will die at this point or slightly before, and that's the freeze avoidant or known as either freeze avoidant or freeze tolerant. So the next thing I needed to find out was whether they were actually dying when they froze, after they froze or before they froze. So I used kind of a range of temperatures around their super cooling point. And again, froze caterpillars and I, uh, took them down to this, a range of temperatures, held them there for a minute, warmed them back up and checked them in after 24 hours to see if they were alive or dead. So this kind of only tells us the immediate effects, of course. Uh, the standard rate for, I use the rates they use for measuring freezing in buds because I, that seemed like a good standard to follow. And I wanted to have some more photos in my presentation. So I, I just wanted to include a couple examples of a freeze avoidant species, which is the pine beetle, which we're all pretty familiar with. So they, they actually cannot tolerate freezing. So they do whatever they can to avoid letting their tissues freeze. Uh, that's going to be the similar strategies to bud moth, which is to remove water, remove any particles, and also produce glycols or sugars to try to prevent your, your cells in particular from freezing. Uh, a lot of frog species are actually freeze tolerant. I think earthworms as well. And so they have some very unique abilities to actually increase like the blood sugar level of their cells and handle extracellular freezing. Uh, so just really interesting, interesting stuff. Back to bud moth. Um, so the first thing I found was that super cooling point was increasing with larval instar. I used these, the three larval spring larval instars, they tend to emerge in the fourth instar, go through a couple molts before they pupate. So this is kind of the stage that has just come out of overwintering. And as you can see, the super cooling point increased as the caterpillar got bigger. And if you think of caterpillars as little sacks of water, the bigger, the more water, and probably the more vulnerable to freezing. That does look like what was happening, happening here. The longer it's also been out and feeding, so. Um, and then as the, yeah, so then of course, uh, survival increased as the temperature increased. So the colder the time spent at a freezing temperature, and this is the minus 4.5 to minus nine range. I had a control group as well of three degrees, which had almost 100% survival. Um, there's not, wasn't a huge difference between instars, but you can definitely see that uh, as you, 
the colder it gets, the more the higher mortality is, and they're probably dying at their when they freeze or before. So the range of a supercooling point is around like eight minus eight to minus nine. Um, and then the lower lethal temperature where 50% of the population was dying was uh, around minus seven to minus eight and, and on average minus three, minus 7.3. So what this tells us is that for as well, uh, they become more uh, less tolerant to cold as they get larger, as they go through molts. The lower lethal temperature is around minus 7.3. So they're dying before the supercooling point. And this points us to them being freeze avoidant at this, at least at this life stage. And they're possibly chill susceptible um, to know what the longer term effects are. We'd have to kind of look, do more studies, of course. Uh, as for like the applied side of things, this this would be a pretty hard frost event. Um, you know, it needs to happen after they've emerged and started feeding. However, what it does also show us is that they go from being tolerant to minus 28 to, to losing that uh, tolerance and dying around minus seven. And as to the chill injury part as well, we don't know if minus seven might cause high mortality, but minus Five might cause enough damage to impact the population as well. So that's the freezing caterpillar part of my study. When I give tell people what I did for my masters, that's the way I describe it. <laughs> freezing caterpillars. You're allowed to, you don't need as many ethics uh, paperwork. You don't have to go through as much paperwork for insects. <laughs> um, so the second part is working with eggs, um, looking at the effects, effects of temperature and humidity. And there isn't a lot of research out there on eggs. There is some, um, definitely a lot more when it comes to vertebrates. So I had three kind of questions here to look at the effects of temperature and humidity. First of all, would hatch and development be negatively impacted by low humidity and temperature? Um, at what stage is humidity mo the most important? And then, of course, the effects of the uh, management. These are my um, chambers for controlling humidity. I use different concentrations of salt solutions to, to control the humidity and put these into either into chambers. You can see the little hobos in there as well for measuring what's happening within the chamber. And this is just kind of the design. So I used a range of temperatures from 15 to 35 and a range of humidities from 20% to 95%. But the first part was just to look at a fixed temperature at different humidity levels. And then the second part was to actually look at what happens when they're exposed to low humidity during the earlier part of egg development, and then what happens when they're exposed to low humidity at the late part of egg development. So what I found was, first of all, there was no survival at 35 degrees across all humidities, so that, that temperature for that long was, was just too much for the eggs. It certainly gets down to minus 35 or minus <laughs> the 35 to 40 degrees in this milk amine, but not for that long of a duration. I do recall some evenings, nights where the low is 18 degrees low, so it is a warm, dry climate. Uh, and humidity levels do get down to 20%, uh, but on average, they're more in the 30s. Um, so survival at 20% humidity was definitely significantly lower than all other humidity levels. And that seems to be exacerbated by temperature. So the warmer it gets, the, the harder it is on survival across all humidities. There definitely was a, a significant, inter oh, well, a close to significant interactive effect of temperature and humidity. So the slowest rate of development was at the lowest humidity treatment and the highest temperature. So this one I found really interesting um, that development actually slowed down at the lowest humidity. So it seems that high temperatures are compounding the risk of desiccation. Um, 
And this slowdown might be an adjustment in physiology to reduce water loss. So for instance, if eggs can reduce their metabolic rate, they'll slow down development in exchange for saving water. And there are some examples of this. The, the tobacco hornworm can adjust its metabolic rate in response to oxygen levels, as can the, um, the stick insect. They're, so the eggs do have some ways of responding to their environment, but it depends on what stage the eggs are in. Um, it's a lot easier to uh, adjust your metabolism when the demands are low. And that might be a kind of what's happening here. Some change in physiology to kind of slow down your development until the conditions are improve. So this is where I swapped um, the eggs and these tables, these graphs are a little hard to, to understand. My supervisor hated this slide and I can understand why, because it's like the worst one to explain, but uh, so bear with me. Um, what I found, first of all, was that uh, the hatch, if the eggs were at low humidity during the first part of their development, then, and they spent the rest of development at high humidity, the hatch was still pretty high. It was significantly higher than when the eggs spent the last part of development at low humidity. So low humidity is very detrimental at the before hatch or before a, a closure. Development rate on the other hand, actually took longer when they were exposed to low humidity at the, let's see here, was faster. <laughs> oh no. Uh, yeah, the development rate was faster when they were exposed to low humidity at the end uh, and slower when they were exposed to low, low humidity at the beginning. And this kind of ties into the, that physiological change. So at the if at the beginning during low humidity, they have that ability to slow down their metabolism, they might do that, but they don't have that option at the later stages of development prior to hatch because there's already a, an almost full grown larva and they're ready to come out and it needs its, its respiration rates aren't as flexible. And for the last part of uh, the kind of field trials, um, I looked at a few different things here. So there's a pretty long flight period. So I looked at kind of their early flight period, the first kind of eight stages of egg laying and then a mid flight period, which is more during that extreme hotter, drier part of year. Uh, so I just wanted to capture those two kind of weather windows. I looked at canopy level as well. These are very exposed canopies. Um, and very controlled environments for moisture. So the upper lower canopy and then irrigation is uh, controlled. I used an orchard where I knew which days each section were being irrigated. So I knew how many days from irrigation uh, we were putting the eggs out. Uh, we had the eggs laid in a, a chamber on plastic and we'd cut them out and, and put them onto the leaves using paper clips and then go monitor and wait for them to hatch or not hatch. So the temperature is highest during the second sampling period, which is to be expected, and it was also higher in the upper canopy. The lowest temperature is in the lowest canopy, as and this was when this was only when irrigation was on. Um, humidity is higher during the early season, and in the lower canopy. Uh, and again, like these there are things in the system that can be controlled. So this is, was an important, was important to kind of look at the, the, uh, the field side of things, but it also adds a lot, of, a lot of variables. You're kind of counting on what's happening at that time of year. You can't control the rain and, and other things. So there were, oh yeah, this was what I just explained. Um, higher temperatures, colder, uh, more humidity. So I didn't find a significant effect between the canopy levels um, or are connected to irrigation, uh, possibly a need a, a flight periods. Um, so during this kind of early high humidity flight period as opposed to the later high temperature flight period. Um, 
And so we do know that the combination of higher temps and low humidity can be detrimental. And there was a significant, uh, significantly lower hatch rate for these later eggs laid on plastic and attached to leaves, which is going to be a little different than what an egg may experience if it's laid onto the leaf. But that was uh, the best we could do so far. Um, the development rate obviously was much higher uh, during the second flight period. That's just related to temperature. But there does seem to be kind of a negative effect uh, the later the eggs go out. And there could be a lot of reasons for that. Um, I mean, there is a benefit, obviously, to them having this long flight window. So that's maybe a strategy in itself to mitigate the effects of that time of year, which isn't maybe the best time of year to be laying eggs. Um, so we do know that the eggs are sensitive to low humidity and temperature, especially prior to eclosion. Uh, there were no effects of irrigation and canopy height that, I that we detected, and that there is lower survival and faster development during the mid-season flight period. So this long kind of flight window um, tells us that maybe the the timing of their egg laying isn't ideal, but they maybe mitigate that by stretching it out. We also don't know if there's maybe some uh, control that the, the moths might have over their egg laying. Maybe they can lay bigger eggs during their second flight period, uh, sacrifice the number of eggs for the higher water content so they have a better chance of surviving. Um, we also don't know if there's longer term effects of these eggs that undergo the really dry conditions. Even though they hatch, they may still be negatively impacted if they come out when it's still in the middle of a heat wave. Um, so a common theme in my study ended up being timing. Um, as I said at the beginning, there's the timing of life stages. There's also the timing within a life stage um, and of different extreme weather events. So to better understand the species response to changing weather patterns, I think it's important to look at extreme events and uh, it's good to look at timing within life stages. And that kind of, of course, you wanna know more about your species life cycle, but also looking at when it's going to be vulnerable is a good management strategy. Uh, and just to summarize, uh, so for the cold tolerance, um, super cooling point increase with instar. The lower lethal temperature was on average of minus 7.3. Uh, the larvae were freeze avoidant um, and possibly chill susceptible. You need a pretty hard frost to kill them, but you it may not need to be so cold to cause some damage. Um, they lose a lot of their tolerability to freezing when uh, they start feeding. Um, Eggs were definitely sensitive to low humidity and higher temperatures. The low humidity was most detrimental at the later stages of development, and there's higher egg survival when it's cooler and wetter. Um, yeah, and then some further kind of studies that could come out of this were looking at modeling. It'd be really great to see what years you see outbreaks. Um, very hard to do though, because of course, within an orchard system, they're going to be uh, trying to manage the pest through other means, whether it's pesticides or uh, when they get tank caterpillars, they use flaming to just burn the, the caterpillar nests. Um, but yeah, I think outbreaks are very connected to climate. That's uh, goes, that seems pretty climate and weather events. So there's some knowing what, knowing what, weather events they may be susceptible to might help you predict future season outbreaks. So if you have a very cool, dry, cool, wet year, you might want to keep an eye out for a species like bud moth. Um, if it's a very hot, dry year, maybe you'll be okay the next year. Uh, I think these pieces of information are pretty important for management and good, good management, not just calendar spraying. Um, there's also a lot of things we don't know about the sublethal effects. So even though there's survival, that doesn't necessarily mean success going through future life stages or with fecundity. And uh, very interesting to learn more about the eggs. Uh, seeing that 
redu reduction in development at lower humidities tells us there's a little bit more going on than just uh, trying to conserve water. Um, and then if there are other strategies like egg size and timing of egg laying. Um, and that's, uh, that's everything. I just want to give my thanks. I'm a fast talker, so I'm at uh, 40 minutes here, but my, my uh, supervisor, Jenny Corey, uh, my committee, uh, Lena, my field, trusty field assistant, <laughs> uh, everyone I did my master's with, and thanks to the Bulkley Valley Research Center for, for hosting me today. Super, thanks so much, Jolene. Great presentation with so many factors to consider. And I'm definitely really curious as to um, impacts in this area and a bit more west. You said it's this is um, relevant to a more humid climate. And uh, so, yeah, l having learnings from that. Thank you.